Now, the rest of the story. It was just a spring exhibition baseball game in Florida's Payne Park, an exhibition game between the Boston Red Sox and the Milwaukee Braves. They used to say that Payne Park was rightly named, at least from a batter's perspective, because it was a big ballpark, a most difficult one in which to hit a home run. Anyway, the Sox and the Braves were going at it that day. Pitching for Boston was a fellow named uh, Ike DeLock, right-hander. Nothing spectacular. Pitched a lot of fastballs. But let's pretend we're watching a movie of this game, and let's run it fast forward so that we can freeze on one frame. It shows Ike on the mound, and the Braves' rookie, the rookie second baseman, at the plate, the second baseman with the bat poised above his shoulder is barely 20. He has been called promising, but then a lot of rookies get called promising. But anyway, on this perfectly ordinary day, in the middle of this perfectly ordinary preseason game, the young second baseman is facing DeLock, and Ike DeLock winds up, and the pitch is a screaming fastball. Ike's specialty. Had it been a curveball or a slider, any other pitch, baseball history might now read differently, but it was a fast ball. And a young second baseman uncoiled with a crusher. I don't know if you know, but that's the thing about a fast ball. Combine the speed of the ball with the speed of the swinging bat, and they connect solidly, then that ball is gone. The Braves manager, Charlie Grimm, couldn't get over it, almost 400 feet to that long left field fence, and the rookie second baseman had sent the ball over the fence and into the trailer park beyond. It was only a preseason game, insignificant, almost every way insignificant, except this is the rest of the story. The Braves manager, Charlie Grimm, had been counting on a recent trade acquisition of his team, a big hitting outfielder named Bobby Thompson. But then right before the opening game of the season, Thompson broke his ankle. Well, that left a gaping hole in left field. There were at least two or three other players who might have filled that position. But manager Grimm, recalling that one stunning, super long, preseason home run by that young second baseman, chose that young man. And the rookie would always be certain that one home run was the reason he stayed with the Braves. And eventually, he was to hit more home runs than anyone in Major League history. I said eventually, he was to hit more home runs than any other, ever. And now you'll remember the day it all began, in March of 1954, for a rookie who was then faltering as a second baseman, a young man named Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron, now you know the rest of the story. And now the rest of the rest of the story. Hank was born Henry Lewis Aaron on February the 5th, 1934. Hank became interested in baseball when he was a child. His family was too poor to afford a baseball bat or even a baseball. But where there's a will, there's a way. Hank practiced his batting by hitting bottle caps with sticks. He made his own bats and balls, I use those terms lightly, out of whatever he could find. An old discarded broomstick or a handle from an axe or hoe, maybe some rocks, nuts, or bottle caps, and he'd get a game going. He could hit whatever they used for a ball harder and farther than anyone else around. In 1949, 15 year old Hank got his first tryout with a Major League Baseball team, the Brooklyn Dodgers. Hank's boyhood idol was the legendary Jackie Robinson, who played for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Everything seemed to be falling into place, but Hank was devastated when he was not selected to join the team. 
In that same year, Hank attended a private school in Alabama called the Josephine Allen Institute. While there, Hank joined the Prechard Athletics, an independent Negro League team. While with the Athletics, Hank earned $2 per game. Adjusted for inflation, that would be about $24 in today's money. Next, he played for the Mobile Black Bears and earned $3 per game. That's about $35 in today's money. November 21st, 1951, a baseball scout who had been watching Hank signed him to a contract with the Indianapolis Clowns where he earned $200 per month. Now that's about $2,350 in today's money. Not too bad. Remember, these teams were in the Negro League and it was the early 1950s. Racism was rampant. Hank remembered back to a time when he and the other Indianapolis clowns visited Washington, D.C. for a game. He said, We had breakfast while we were waiting for the rain to stop, and I can still envision sitting with the clowns in a restaurant behind Griffith Stadium and hearing them break all the plates in the kitchen after we finished eating. What a horrible sound. Even as a kid, the irony of it hit me. Here we were in the capital, in the land of freedom and equality, and they had to destroy the plates that had touched the forks that had been in the mouths of black men. If dogs had eaten off those plates, they would have just washed them. It's hard to imagine how that must have felt. Hank was homesick. The constant racism was wearing him down. He contemplated giving up baseball altogether. His brother, Herbert Era Jr., convinced Hank to keep working toward his dream. Had it not been for Herbert Jr., the world probably would never have known Hank Aaron. With a pep talk from his brother, Hank worked harder than ever. Word of Hank's talent spread while he was with the clowns. After just three months with the clowns, Hank received two telegrams with offers to join two Major League Baseball teams the New York Giants, and the Boston Braves. Hank later recalled, I had the Giants contract in my hand, but the Braves offered $50 a month more. That's the only thing that kept Willie Mays and me from being teammates. $50. Now $50 a month may not sound like much, but that would be nearly $600 a month in today's money. What would you do? Hank decided on the Braves, but remember he was still under contract to the Clowns. The Braves purchased Hank's contract for $10,000, which is just over $117,000 in today's money. They thought it was a good deal. On June the 12th, 1952, Hank officially joined the Braves. He quickly earned a nickname, but the nickname had nothing to do with his powerful hitting. His teammates called him Pork Chops. Hank explained, it was the only thing I knew to order off the menu. One of his teammates said, the man ate pork chops three meals a day, two for breakfast. Hank prospered with the Braves. By the end of his first season with the Braves, the league unanimously named him Rookie of the Year. In the following year, 1953, the Braves won the league championship. Hank led the league in runs, hits, Doubles, RBIs, total bases, and batting average. Wow! Hank won the league's Most Valuable Player Award. Still, there was racism aimed at Hank. One sports writer said, Henry Aaron, he didn't refer to him as Hank, that came later. Henry Aaron led the league in everything except hotel accommodations. You see, while traveling in the South, Hank was segregated from his teammates due to Jim Crow laws. While his white teammates had hotel accommodations made for them, Hank had to arrange for his own hotel accommodations. Due to his powerful batting and the Braves' public relations director, Henry earned several other nicknames. PR director Don Davidson only referred to Henry as Hank, which quickly caught on. Fans called him Hammer or Hammer and Hank, Opposing pitchers often called him Bad Henry. Throughout his career, Hank earned many accolades, too many to list here. In 1973, 
Something big was happening. Hank, then playing for the Atlanta Braves, was closing in on Babe Ruth's career home run record of 714 home runs. During the summer of 1973, Hank received so many letters each week, usually in the thousands, that the Braves hired a secretary to help him. But not all of that mail Hank received was positive. Hank received a lot of hate mail. How dare he even attempt to break Babe Ruth's record? On September 29, 1973, Hank hit his 713th career home run in a game against the Houston Astros. He had just one more home run to tie Babe Ruth's record. Two more home runs to beat Babe Ruth's record. But Hank failed to hit another home run in that game, and the season ended the following day. Hank feared that he would not live to see the 1974 baseball season. During the offseason, his amount of mail, including hate mail, increased. He received so much mail that at the end of 1973, the U.S. Postal Service sent him a plaque for receiving more mail than any other person with the exclusion of politicians. He received approximately 930,000 letters that year. Many of those letters included death threats. Louis Grizzard, executive sports editor of the Atlanta Journal, who had been preparing coverage on the home run record, secretly had one of the sports writers write an obituary for Hank because he was afraid that Hank would be murdered before he had a chance to break Babe Ruth's record. That's how serious it was. But Hank did live to play in the 1974 season. There was a problem. Braves managers wanted Hank to beat Babe Ruth's record while in Atlanta at a home game, but their first three games were away games. The managers were going to have Hank sit out of the first three games, but the baseball commissioner insisted that Hank play in at least two of the three games. On April 4, 1974, in a game against the Cincinnati Reds in Cincinnati, Hank made a home run and tied Babe Ruth's record. The crowd went wild. The manager certainly wanted to win the game, but they did not want Hank to make another home run before returning home to Atlanta. And Hank did not hit another home run in an away game. Four days later, April 8, 1974, the Braves played against the L.A. Dodgers in Atlanta. It was a home game. A record-breaking 53,775 people attended that game. In the fourth inning, Al Downing of the Dodgers pitched the ball. Hank swung. The ball flew over the left center field and into the Braves' bullpen. Cannons fired in celebration. Hank Aaron had broken Babe Ruth's record. Now, I'll leave a link to this record-breaking moment in the description below. You really ought to see it. Hank Aaron is one of the most revered players in baseball history. And it all started with sticks and bottle caps. I'm Brad Dyson. Thanks for watching. And now you know the rest of the rest of the story.